Dear fellow truth seekers, thank you and welcome for visiting my channel, Mythorreligio. Mythorreligio is a video channel based on a book series with the same name about religious comparison studies between the stories in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, directly from their sacred books and world mythologies, hence the name Mythorreligio. The purpose is to retrace the prehistory of humanity, since I'm not fully satisfied with either the explanations from the point of view of creationists nor evolutionists. There are so many missing links in both explanations. If you feel the same, then you are on the right channel. In this channel, I will also analyze about the prehistory of humanity from the archaeological records, modern scientific point of view, and other alternative theories such as the ancient alien theories and Atlantis or Lemuria legends. After thorough research of circa 30 years, I recognize many, many similarities between all religious stories and even mythologies, and surprisingly, some of them are in accordance or even beyond modern science that have been proven as correct. Thus, I came to the conclusion that all religions must have come from the same source. And all these religious stories and mythologies, although heavily jumbled up, are actually telling one mega story, the true prehistory of our common ancestors. This mega story is quite different than what we have been told to believe and will truly blow your mind as it is more fascinating than our imagination. If you have watched the earlier videos in this channel, I believe you can see some of the similarities too. If you haven't and you truly want to do a religious comparative study, I suggest that you do so. The best way to do a comprehensive religious study via this channel is by watching the videos starting from number one and continue until this present video and so on. That way you will see a clear pattern. In this channel, I will share almost all that I have written in my book series. However, there is one book so far that I cannot share in this channel due to its sensitive, shocking, and dark nature, and also might be considered controversial to some, but I believe it sheds more light to the above conclusion. If you want to read this around 500 pages ebook with many full color illustrations, you are more than welcome to download book number 5 entitled History of the Dark Side that is available for free in ebook format that can be found in my website www.mythorologio.com You only have to give your email address and it will be sent to you directly. And no, I won't share your email address nor send any advertisement. The link is in the description box. If you want to get the physical book, kindly go to amazon.com. Now let's continue with this week's video. What causes evolution? Dear fellow truth seekers, for the last few weeks, I have shared with you the scientific theories on the origin of life, i.e. the theory of evolution and the Big Bang Theory, for our religious versus science comparison study. I did this in order to find answers to questions that are not answered satisfactorily by religion. In my last video, I have shared with you one of the many missing links in the theory of evolution that haven't been answered by science, i.e how the first living cell emerged from barren, lifeless Earth. Now let's continue to analyze other missing links. According to the evolution theory, the early single-celled organisms evolved into multicellulars that finally became the variety of species that we know today. But how did that happen? What is causing evolution? The cause of evolution according to the modern theory of evolution is a combination of natural selection and mutation. 1. Natural Selection Natural selection is the process by which those heritable traits that make it more likely for an organism to survive and successfully reproduce become more common in a population over successive generations. Darwin put it in simple words which are survival of the fittest. 2. Mutations Mutations are defined as breaks or replacements taking place in the DNA molecule 
which is found in the nuclei or center of the cells of a living organism and which contains all its genetic information. These breaks or replacements are the result of external effects such as radiation or chemical action. Every mutation is an accident and either damages the nucleotides making up the DNA or changes their locations. Most of the time they cause so much damage and modification that the cell cannot repair them. However, according to the evolution theory, there are advantageous mutations that can cause evolution. As mentioned previously, when Darwin proposed the evolution theory, he only came up with the natural selection as the cause of evolution. With the advancements in the field of genetics, the random mutation is added. The following are some examples of natural selection and random mutations. Natural selection of peppered moth. One example that is very often used as a classic example of evolution in action through natural selection is the change in color of the peppered moth after the Industrial Revolution. Almost every biology textbook retells the story. In some countries, it is compulsory learning. This is how it goes. When newly industrialized part of Britain became polluted in the 19th century, smoke killed lichens, a composite plant of fungus and algae, growing on trees and blackened their bark. Pale colored moth, which had been well camouflaged before when they rested on the tree trunks, became very clearly visible and were eaten by birds. Rare dark moth, which had been visible before, were now well camouflaged in the black background. As birds switched from eating mainly dark moth to mainly pale moth, the most common moth color changed from pale to dark. Natural selection had caused a change in the British moth population. The moth had evolved. This hypothesis was proposed by J. W. Tutt in 1896 and tested by Bernard Cattlewell in the 1950s. It then became a classic example of Darwinian evolution in action. However, this theory has two limitations as an example of evolution. First limitation, this case only involves a very small scale change. The pale and dark forms of the peppered moth are similar in every way except for their superficial color. The two types are both part of the same species and can interbreed. Moreover, both types existed before the Industrial Revolution. It is only the frequency of the different types which has changed. Since smoke pollution has decreased in the UK, the light-colored moth have started to become dominant again. The process which took place after the Industrial Revolution is beginning to be reversed. By 2019, the dark moth are only expected to make up 1% of the peppered moth population in Britain. The peppered moth story only provides evidence for fluctuating frequencies of different types of moth. It does not give evidence for large-scale evolutionary changes involving new organs or body parts. It does not show us how moth came into existence in the first place. Second limitation. The evidence that predation by birds has caused the change in frequency of moth color rests on a series of experiments, which are now known to have been flawed. Bernard Cattlewell, who carried out most of the studies, assumed that the moth rested on tree trunks during the day. However, it is very difficult to find wild moth in their natural resting places. Most textbook photos are dead moth glued to tree trunks. Painstaking subsequent observations of wild moth have shown that they prefer to settle underneath the leaves. Another problem is that cattle well release its moth at the wrong time of the day. This means that they were not able to settle naturally in their preferred resting site. Furthermore, he released large numbers of moth which may have created an artificial magnet for predatory birds. The experiments were simply too artificial. The moth were released at the wrong time of the day, in the wrong places, and in the wrong numbers. Most importantly, the peppered moth remains a peppered moth. These facts were uncovered by the scientific community 
only in the late 1990s. So why am I sharing this example? Because this story is still told in most evolution books today. Furthermore, I cannot find any example of natural selection, because apparently scientists too cannot find any. No one has ever produced a species of mechanisms of natural selection. No one has ever got near it, and most of the current argument in Neo-Darwinism is about this question. Colin Patterson, prominent evolutionist and senior paleontologist of the British Museum of Natural History in London, BBC Interview, 1982. Wow, I don't understand this. Isn't one of the central concepts in science and scientific method is that all evidence must be empirical, that is based on verifiable observation? How can we be sure that natural selection truly caused evolution, when even evolutionist scientists themselves admit that they could not find an example of it? The collapse of the story of the peppered moth, which have been one of the most important examples in introduction to evolution courses in universities for decades, greatly disappointed evolutionists. One of them, Jerry Coyne, an American professor of biology, remarked in Not Black and White. My own reaction resembles the dismay attending my discovery at the age of six that it was my father and not Santa who brought the presents on Christmas Eve. Natural Selection and Mutation in Bacteria Antibiotic is a medicine that kills bacteria. We have all been told by our doctors not to overuse antibiotics because over time bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics. The more we use antibiotics, the more resistance bacteria develop and the harder it is to kill them. This case is commonly used as a well-known example of natural selection combined with mutations in action. However, this example too has been challenged by an Israeli biophysicist and writer of Not By Chance, Professor Lee Spatner, who has done the most detailed research into this subject. Spatner maintains that the immunity of bacteria comes about by two different mechanisms, but neither of them constitutes evidence for the theory of evolution. These mechanisms are 1. The transfer of resistance genes already extant in bacteria. 2. The building of resistance as a result of losing genetic data because of mutation. Spatner explains the first mechanism in an article, Lee Spatner slash Edward Max Dialogue, continuing an exchange with Dr. Edward E. Max, published in 2001. Some microorganisms are endowed with genes that grant resistance to these antibiotics. This resistance can take the form of degrading the antibiotic molecule or of ejecting it from the cell. The organisms having these genes can transfer them to other bacteria, making them resistant as well. Although the resistance mechanisms are specific to a particular antibiotic, most pathogenic bacteria have succeeded in accumulating several sets of genes granting them resistance to a variety of antibiotics. Spatner then goes on to say that this is not evidence for evolution. The acquisition of antibiotics resistance in this manner is not the kind can serve as a prototype for the mutations needed to account for evolution. The genetic changes that could illustrate the theory must not only add information to the bacterium's genome, they must add new information to the biocosm. The horizontal transfer of genes only spreads around genes that are already in some species. Therefore, we cannot use this as an example of evolution because no new genetic information is produced. The genetic information that already exists is simply transferred between bacteria. Stephen Jay Gould wrote in The Return of Hopeful Monsters, The essence of Darwinism lies in a single phrase, natural selection is the creative force of evolutionary change. No one denies that selection will play a negative role in eliminating the unfit. Darwinian theorists require that it create the fit as well. The second type of immunity which comes about as a result of mutation is not an example of evolution either. Spatner wrote, 
microorganism can sometimes acquire resistance to an antibiotic through a random substitution of a single nucleotide, streptomycin, which was discovered by Solomon Waxman and Albert Schatz and first reported in 1944, is an antibiotic against which bacteria can acquire resistance in this way. But although the mutation they undergo in the process is beneficial to the microorganism in the presence of streptomycin, it cannot serve as a prototype for the kind of mutations needed by NDT, Neo-Darwinian theory. The type of mutation that grants resistance to streptomycin is manifest in the ribosome and degrades its molecular match with the antibiotic molecule. This change in the surface of the microorganism's ribosome prevents the streptomycin molecule from attaching and carrying out its antibiotic function. It turns out that this degradation is a loss of specificity and therefore a loss of information. The main point is that evolution cannot be achieved by mutations of this sort, no matter how many of them there are. Evolution cannot be built accumulating mutations that only degrade specificity. To sum up, a mutation impinging on a bacterium's ribosome makes that bacterium resistant to streptomycin. The reason for this is the decomposition of the ribosome by mutation. That is, no new genetic information is added to the bacterium. On the contrary, the structure of the ribosome is decomposed. That is to say, the bacterium becomes disabled. Also, it has been discovered that the ribosome of the mutated bacterium is less functional than that of normal bacterium. Since this disability prevents the antibiotic from attaching onto the ribosome, antibiotic resistance develops. Finally, there is no example of mutation that develops the genetic information. The same situation holds true for the immunity that insects develop to DDT and similar insecticides. In most of these instances, immunity genes that already exist are used. The evolutionist biologist Francisco Ayala in The Mechanisms of Evolution, Scientific American, Volume 239, September 1978, admits this fact saying, the genetic variants required for resistance to the most diverse kinds of pesticides were apparently present in every one of the populations exposed to these man-made compounds. Some other examples explained by mutation, just as with the ribosome mutation mentioned above, are phenomena that cause genetic information deficit in insects. In this case, it cannot be claimed that the immunity mechanisms in bacteria and insects constitute evidence for the theory of evolution. That is because the theory of evolution is based on the assertion that living things develop through mutations. However, Spatner explains that neither antibiotic immunity nor any other biological phenomena indicates such an example of mutation. The mutations needed for macroevolution have never been observed. No random mutations that could represent the mutations required by Neo-Darwinian theory that have been examined on the molecular level have added any information. The question I address is, are the mutations that have been observed the kind the theory needs for support? The answer turns out to be no. The effect of mutation Although, according to the evolution theory, there is advantageous mutation that could cause evolution, we do not have any example of it. But we do have countless evidence that the direct effect of mutations is harmful. The changes affected by mutations can only be like those experienced by people in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Chernobyl, that is death, disability, and sickness. The reason for this is very simple. DNA has a very complex structure, and random effects can only damage the organism. B.G. Ranganathan in Origins states, First, genuine mutations are very rare in nature. Secondly, most mutations are harmful since they are random, rather than orderly changes in the structure of genes. Any random change in a highly ordered system will be for the worse, not for the better. For example, 
If an earthquake were to shake a highly ordered structure such as a building, there would be no random change in the framework of the building which, in all probability, would not be an improvement. Not surprisingly, no useful mutations have been so far observed. All mutations have been proven to be harmful. The evolutionist scientist Warren Weaver comments on the report prepared by the Committee on Genetic Effects of Atomic Radiation, which had been formed to investigate mutations that might have been caused by the nuclear weapons used in the Second World War. Many will be puzzled about the statement that practically all known mutant genes are harmful. For mutations are a necessary part of the process of evolution, how can a good effect evolution to higher forms of life results from mutations practically all of which are harmful. So far, every effort put into generating a useful mutation has resulted in failure. For decades, scientists carried out many experiments to produce mutations in fruit flies as these insects reproduce very rapidly and so mutations would show up quickly. Generation upon generation of these flies were mutated yet no useful mutation was ever observed. The evolutionist geneticist Gordon Taylor in The Great Evolution Mystery writes thus, It is a striking but not much mentioned fact that through geneticists have been breeding fruit flies for 60 years or more in labs all around the world flies, which produce a new generation every 11 days, they have never yet seen the emergence of a new species or even a new enzyme. Another researcher, Michael Pittman, in Adam and Evolution, comments on the failure of the experiments carried out on fruit flies. Morgan, Goldschmidt, Mueller, and other geneticists have subjected generations of fruit flies to extreme conditions of heat, cold, light, dark, and treatment by chemicals and radiation. All sorts of mutations, practically all trivial or positively deleterious, have been produced. Man-made evolution? Not really. Few of the geneticist monsters could have survived outside the battles they were bred in. In practice, mutants die, are sterile or tend to revert to the wild type. The same holds true for men. All mutations that have been observed in human beings have had deleterious results. All mutations that take place in human results in physical deformities, in infirmities such as Mongolism, Down syndrome, dwarfism or cancer. These mutations are presented in evolutionist textbooks as examples of the evolutionary mechanism at work. Needless to say, a process that leaves people disabled or sick cannot be an evolutionary mechanism. Evolution is supposed to produce forms that are better fitted to survive. To summarize, there are three main reasons why mutations cannot be used to support the evolution theory. One. The direct effect of mutations is harmful. Since they occur randomly, they almost always damage the living organism that undergoes them. Reason tells us that unconscious intervention in a perfect and complex structure will not improve that structure, but will rather impair it. Indeed, no useful mutation has ever been observed. 2. Mutations add no new information to an organism's DNA. As a result of mutations, the particles making up the genetic information are either torn from their places, destroyed, or carried off to different places. Mutations cannot make a living thing acquire a new organ or a new trait. They only cause abnormalities like a leg sticking out of the back or an ear from the abdomen. 3. In order for a mutation to be transferred to the subsequent generation, it has to have taken place in the reproductive cells of the organism. A random change that occurs in a cell or organ of the body cannot be transferred to the next generation. For example, a human eye altered by the effects of radiation or by other causes will not be passed on to subsequent generations. So, upon analysis, both the evolutionary concepts of natural selection and mutation are actually hard to defend. It doesn't matter how many Hollywood movies are made about advantageous mutation that can make a human turn into a superhuman, unfortunately, in reality, mutation is always harmless.
Next week, we will continue to analyze more missing links in the theory of evolution. But for now, allow me to thank you for watching and hope to see you next week.